Thanks, Kerry. And, and uh, thank you uh, for the organisers to think to ask a, a pathologist to come and talk to patients. Uh, as pathologists, we're generally known as doctors that speak only to other doctors. We rarely actually interact with patients, but obviously, uh, like any other doctors, we have the patient's best interests uh, that sort of underpins all our work. Um, so I'm actually, I work in the Department of Neuropathology at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital and I run a brain uh, tumour research group at the Brain and Mind Research Institute as well. And I'm going to talk a, a bit about how the pathologist assesses, you know, what sort of tumour it is. And uh, I've broken my talk down into these four, um, uh, actually I'll, I'll get to that, but um, th these four general um, things that, that a, a neuropathologist or any other pathologist uh, tends to do. So um, provide intraoperative consultations as needed. Sometimes when the surgeons are, are removing a tumour, they need to know, get a bit more information to guide uh, the, the parts of their surgery. So what they will do is they will stop the operation, take a small piece of tumour and send it to the path lab and it, the pathologist will then have a quick look at it, give them a call back and say to them, yep, you're in tumour, you, you've, you know, you've got the target, you're in tumour, or they might say, uh, no, actually this isn't tumour, this is something else, this is an infection, you better stop the operation. So uh, not every operation needs that, many operations don't need it, but uh, it's something that... Uh, uh, that, that is required on a, on a semi-regular basis. Uh, and probably the main role of the pathologist is to provide the final tumour diagnosis and the grade. So once the operation is finished, the surgeon will place the tumour into some formalin to fix it and send it down to the pathology lab. It then gets processed overnight or over two days and then it will come out as microscope slides for us to look at. Uh, at this stage, the pathology really defines um, the, the ongoing treatment algorithm, algorithms after the patient's surgery. Uh, and then also the pathologist will then guide uh, appropriate ancillary tests for molecular markers. Different uh, tumours may require different uh, molecular markers and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, of course, also we've got to communicate with the surgeons and the oncologists and the, the radiation therapists. That's predominantly in the multidisciplinary uh, team setting where we all get together in the one room and, uh, and uh, talk about um, the radiology, the pathology, and, and how we're going to progress from there. So as I've said, the intraoperative consultations is when the neurosurgeon sends a small piece of tissue down to the pathology lab to get an idea of what they're doing. Uh, and some of the questions that uh, we, we commonly get, is this a lymphoma or a glioma? Now that's very important because the treatment of lymphoma is not to cut it out. The treatment of lymphoma is chemotherapy. So uh, whereas the treatment for a glioma is to cut it out and then give radio and chemotherapy. So sometimes, I mean the radiologists are very clever, often they'll know. They'll say to the surgeon, the surgeon will know before they go in there that what they're dealing with but uh, not always, and so that's an, um, uh, an important part of our job. Uh, and some of the other questions, is this a high-grade glioma or is it metastatic cancer? That may well change the extent of the, tu of the resection that the, the surgeon decides to undertake, uh, or is this tumour or something else such as demyelination like multiple sclerosis? Um, what we do in the lab with these small pieces of tissue uh, is we do what's called a, a smear, get a tiny match head sized piece of tissue and squash it between two microscope slides. And we put it through these solutions to stain it up and we ended up with some smears like this. A tiny piece of tissue smeared down the slide. Uh, and at high power we can actually get a fantastic deep look at the cells making up the tumour. Uh, and that's, that's uh, uh, very important. And as well as doing that intraoperative smear, we also cut a frozen section. So the bit of the tumour we don't smear between the two slides, we actually freeze in liquid nitrogen in some special uh, embedding medium, and then we cut it on this special machine called the cryostat. That machine keeps the tissue frozen. When it's frozen and it's hard, we can cut very thin sections. Uh, and we need to have very thin sections to be able to look through them with the microscope. Uh, once again, once those frozen sections are cut, they're stained, and then we can look at them under the microscope. And that's when we then call back to the surgeon and say, 
you know, we think this is a high-grade glioma or, or uh, whatever we think it is. Uh, but it's important to know uh, that the smear in the frozen section is a preliminary report only. It's not as good as the formal pathology and the role of the intraoperative consultation is to guide the surgeon for those specific questions. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon, though, that that frozen section report is communicated to the patients um, after, or the patient's family after their surgery. And it's important to remember that, uh, on average, about 10% of frozen section diagnoses are changed in the final pathology report. And that final pathology report will take a week or so to come out. So uh, I, I don't know if many of you have had that experience where uh, you've had been told, oh, it's a this, but then a week later it's slightly changed to something else. But that's very important. To, it's the formal pathology report which then forms the basis for the treatment decisions after surgery. The formal pathology report is based on this book, this WHO classification of tumours of the central nervous system. This is essentially used all over the world and it's certainly used here in Australia. And uh, it's the, this classification of the tumours is based almost exclusively on morphology. So what the tumour looks like under the microscope. We've already heard a little bit about molecular tests today. It's a very exciting part of, of, of research. But today, to, to date, they are not changing the diagnosis. The diagnosis rests on what the tumour looks like down the microscope. Uh, and to get to uh, some lovely pretty pic tumour pictures like this, we have to fix the tumour in formalin. We embed it in paraffin wax, and once again by doing that we're able to cut very thin sections. We can stain them up and look at them under the microscope. Uh, Neuropathology has got a lot of very confusing names in it um, uh, and the reason for that is that tumours are, are, are called based on what they, how they resemble normal cells of the brain. Um, so uh, the predominant cells of the brain, we have glial cells, they're the supporting cells and then we have the neurons or the ganglion cells, they're the ones that actually are doing the information processing. Um, but uh, the glial cells tend to give a lot of, uh, rise to a lot of the intrinsic brain tumours, hence they're called gliomas. And uh, of the glial cells, there are different types, and the different types we can recognise in normal brains. There's the astrocytes, and if the tumour looks like malignant astrocytes, it's called an astrocytoma, or if it's particularly bad, it's called a glioblastoma. There are oligodendrocytes, they're very important in the normal brain because they actually provide the, uh, like the electrical um, uh, coating of um, the coating of all the nerve cell processes. They're like uh, insulation on, on electrical, uh, electrical wires. Uh, and the oligodendrocytes, if, if the tumour looks like malignant oligodendrocytes, it's called an oligodendroglioma. And similarly, we have ependymal cells and ependymomas. Uh, neurons used to be called ganglion cells, so we have gangliocytoma, ganglioglioma. And it's the same with some of the other tumours like uh, meningiomas are based on the fact that they look like normal meningothelial cells. And just a few pictures here of, uh, of uh, uh, some uh, tumours. This is an astrocytoma. These tumour cells look like astrocytes. I don't expect you to understand this completely, but take my word for it that they look like astrocytes and they certainly have these long processes coming out of them, which is typical that we see in, in normal, non-neoplastic astrocytes. And uh, this tumour here is an oligonedroglioma. It looks very different. Uh, it has these round nuclei with a sort of clearing of the cytoplasm around them. So it's this sort of look of the tumour that, that forms our diagnosis. This is an astrocytoma, this is an oligodendroglioma, etc. Now once we know what sort of tumour it is, we then have to grade it. And once again we use the WHO grading system, which um, is, has four levels. Um, and it's based on curability and clinical survival. Basically, grade one tumours are tumours that we are discrete, and can be cut out, and if they can be cut out completely, they won't come back. Uh, so they essentially, they can be cured if they can be cut out completely. 
And as we've heard before about skull-based tumours, often they are grade one, but because of their location, they can't be cut out completely and they have to be managed uh, in, in other ways. And then we have increasing grades of malignancy, two, three and four. These are more infiltrative tumours and much harder to cut out and often need uh, adjuvant therapy. Now, the grading is dependent on the tumour type. Uh, and so uh, we look for a variety of morphological features to decide what grade a glioma is. And one of those might be the presence of, of tumour necrosis or tumor areas of the tumour that are dying. Now, in the context of an astrocytoma, then that has a certain implication. In the context of an oligodendroglioma, it has a different implication. So there's this hierarchical thing. You've got to work out what the tumour is first, and then the, gr the, the features uh, to grade that type of tumour are distinct to that type of tumour. And I hope that make, makes uh, sense to you. All right, so that's really the routine um, uh, histopathology of, of brain tumours. Uh, and I'm just, just going to move on now to briefly touch on three molecular markers uh, that are finding their way in the, into the pathology labs uh, of Australia and uh, are certainly <coughs> useful sometimes to pathologists, sometimes to oncologists. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, iso isocitrate dehydrogenase mutations. Uh, they're particularly relevant in the grade 2 and 3 astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas. I'm going to be talking about 1P19Q co-deletion, which is particularly relevant to oligodendroglioma, not so much to the other tumour types. And then I'm also going to be talking about MGMT promoter methylation, which is particularly relevant to glioblastoma as opposed to the other tumour types. Uh, so um, I don't know. Everyone in medical school when I was a young student had to learn the Krebs cycle, and it was a dreadful thing to learn. You had to just wrote, learn this... this uh, this whole uh, sort of circle of different enzymes and it was a dreadful thing to learn and it's ironic now that uh, after about 25 years it actually found, I found out the Krebs cycle is very important uh, because the isocitrate dehydrogenase enzymes are a part of that Krebs cycle and they're involved in energy generation in the mitochondria uh, and um, they, mutations particularly in IDH1 there's three different isoforms of this isocitrate dehydrogenase, but IDH1 is commonly mutated in the grade 2 and the grade 3 astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas. We find this, um, uh, this obviously has a, a, a lot of very exciting uh, implications for basic research, but from the pathologist's point of view, making a diagnosis, it's very helpful because the presence of an IDH mutation actually helps to confirm our his morphological diagnosis that this is a grade 2 oligodendroglioma. Um, uh, the absence of IDH mutations in these tumours suggests, preliminary results suggest they might behave a bit more aggressively, but the data is still very preliminary. 1P9NQ loss in oligodendrogliomas. This is commonly looked at if the pathology report says oligodendroglioma. And in these tumours, they tend to lose the short arm of chromosome 1 and the long arm of chromosome 19 together. Uh, and it's about 70 to 80 percent of oligodendrogliomas have this 1P9NQ co-deletion. Uh, it's very rare in other tumour types. So we tend to only test the ones that are oligodendrogliomas. Uh, it certainly has prognostic and predictive value. Uh, the tumours that have this deletion tend to be slower growing and they tend to respond better to uh, uh, chemo and radiotherapy. Um, these stats are probably a bit out of date now, so I wouldn't, don't take those as, as Bible. Uh, but it does give us an idea of if this tumour is going to behave uh, you know, well or, or it's going to be a bit of a naughty tumour. And um, this does have a bit of relevance to the oncologists. If they, if they have a diagnosis of an oligodendroglioma and it's got 1P9NQ co-deletion, an oncologist might decide to hold off on treatment because they know that the tumour is going to grow a little bit slower than, than if it didn't have that. Uh, and they may decide to treat earlier if there's no 1P9NQ co-deletion. And I think you know, every oncologist has, has um, their own uh, way of deciding and it's, there's many factors involved in the decision on how, how and when to treat uh, and it's certainly not my area of, of specialisation. Um, I, look, I won't go into uh, the, actually how we test for it but what I will say is we get some very pretty fluorescent photographs 
Um, and you can see here we have, uh, this is a cell here, and we've got one red dot and two green dots. So, whoops, oh, what have I done there? Um, so uh, the, the red dot is 1P, and the green dot is the other art part of chromosome 1, which is 1Q. And we can see that we've only got one copy of 1P, but we've got two copies of 1Q, so there's a relative 1P loss. And that's how we assess it uh, in, the, in our path lab, at least. And the last thing I'm just going to touch on is MGMT promoter methylation. And I, I did hear the, the question this morning about MGMT promoter methylation. So we know that MGMT, it's a DNA repair enzyme. It's very helpful for normal cells because it repairs damage to DNA. Uh, the problem in tumour cells, though, is that um, chemotherapy damages DNA, and you want it to do that because you want to kill the tumour cells. But if they still have MGMT, then they can actually partly repair the damage done by the chemotherapy, so they make it less effective. Uh, and MGMT promoter methylation is a measurement of switching off of MGMT. So glioblastomas with MGMT methylation, that means that the MGMT enzyme is switched off, they can't repair their DNA damage so well, so the chemotherapy tends to work a bit better. So um, they respond better to chemo. Uh, that's just how we assess it in our lab. We use pyrosequencing, which is a, a, a relatively specialised technology uh, to look at, um, at that. Um, it's only really relevant in glioblastomas. Uh, it's not particularly relevant in other uh, tumour types. But it may also guide the choice of radiotherapy or chemotherapy in older patients that are unable to withstand the, 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 the harsh regime of combined chemoradiotherapy. Um, oncologists might decide, are we going to give chemotherapy if the MGMT is methylated? And if it's not, we're going to give radiotherapy because we know we can't, they, can't, um, they can't cope with both. So that's uh, just gradually creeping in as, as a sometimes a guiding treatment choice. Uh, look, I've come, I think I've gone over time, but uh, this is our website. So a lot of this information is on our website, uh, and you don't have to take down that address. You could just Google RPA Neuropathology, and it'll, it'll come up as well. So thank you. Thanks, Michael. So we... And in the e program, it actually says hold your questions till later. But I think we can take, since the whole program's blown out now, I think we can um, take some, some questions from the audience. So, has anyone got any burning questions they'd like to ask now? Hang on. You had to be over there, didn't you? <laughs> Hi, I'm Matthew. I don't know if that's working. Um, so I was diagnosed initially with an astrocytoma from Canberra through their pathology. And then I had further surgery two months later and it was diagnosed as the oligodendron glioma. Sorry if I got that wrong. So I'm wondering how, that, how there could be a difference and what the difference in the pathology techniques may be used. That was all. Uh, that, uh, that's a good question. Though. It's, it's hard to comment on, uh, say, Canberra pathology. I, I'm not exactly sure what, what they do down there. Um, the diagnosis of brain tumours, particularly if only a small piece is removed, can be quite difficult. Uh, uh, so it may be that your first surgery you had only a small piece assessed for pathology and then a larger piece the second time around, which uh, made it more powerful for... Um, the um, you know the morphological diagnosis, but I guess like any part of um, of medicine, there's you know there's no there's nothing is perfect, um, and I, some clinicians and I think some patients as well think of pathology as like the laundry service. You just sort of pop it in and you'll get the answer back the next day, uh, and it's not. It's it's very complex and specialised uh, area. So uh, like any other area of medicine, there is a degree of un uncertainty. Any other questions? Yeah. Hang, hang on. We're just on the video, so just a sec. It's all right. Okay, go for it. 
With a, an oglioastrocytoma, a mixed one, I understand it's referred to, does that mean that there's two different ones in the same site or is it actually affecting different parts of the brain? Um, that's a good question. I haven't talked about oligoastrocytomas, um, but they are thought to be uh, mixed tumours that have histological features of astrocyte, astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. It's, it's the one tumour. Uh, it's not like two tumours in two separate locations. It's the one tumour, but it's thought that the, some of the tumour cells look like astrocytes and some of the tumour cells look like oligodendrocytes. And um, it might be that those two cell types are intermingled and you can see them both types down one microscope field or it might be that over this part of the tumour it looks like an oligodendroglioma and that part of the tumour looks like an astrocytoma. But it's still the one tumour. It's quite a controversial diagnosis, oligoastrocytoma, and it's the least reproducible diagnosis uh, in pathology at the moment. Uh, so in terms of a need for more molecular markers, I think the oligoastrocytomas are the ones where we're particularly are interested in doing 1P9NQ, assessing the IDH, uh, as well. Just got one more question over here. Hello, it's Susan from Brain Tumor Alliance Australia. I just wanted to ask you to comment on the costs of the ge genetic marker testing. What, what does it cost to you as a patient or you as a health centre? Thank you. Yes, that's, um, that's a very, very pertinent question. So none of the molecular tests are covered under Medicare. They're, none of them are Medicare rebatable. Um, that has affected pathology labs being willing to offer them because uh, they are going to lose money on them. Um, uh, we, everyone has different approaches. So our approach is we actually, we will ask either external, if we get referrals in from other hospitals, we will ask the oncology or the neurosurgery department to pay, otherwise the patient has to, has to pay. Uh, for that reason we've kept uh, prices down to the bare minimum uh, and I suspect in fact we're, we're making a loss um, but I think it's an important service to keep going. Um, so I can tell you that if we need to do sequencing for IDH um, it's about $150 and if we need to do 1P9NQ fish it's about $285. If we need to do MGMT promoter methylation that's also about $150 and to be honest uh, I'm sure I'm pretty sure we're we're making a loss on all of those. One of the problems uh, with these sort of tests is they're so boutique-y. Um, there's plenty of uh, uh, colon cancers out there, but not many brain cancers. So we, we'd ru we run the tests with a volume of you know one or two tests at a time. If you could ramp that up to 30 tests at a time, you could get the costs down. But because there's not that many brain tumours and the results are needed in a relatively timely fashion, we have to run them as you know, a single sample or two samples. And it takes one scientist the same amount of time to run one sample as it does to run 20 samples. So you're looking at sort of personnel hours there as well. But that's the rough costings. And again, we've actually got all our costings on our website as well. And of course we do waive them in, in you know, special circumstances. Well, thank you very much. Could everyone join me in thanking Michael again? He's great. <laughs>